yes, God has already been here. Amen. The, the title of the message today is when God says no to you, how do you respond? How do you respond when God says no? When God says no to you, how do you handle the situation? We know how to act when God says yes. We all do. We know when God says yes to our needs, our prayers. We know how to act when God says yes. We respond with joy. Our faith is made stronger. And many things can happen when the answer is yes. But when life does not give you what you want, how do you handle it? You see, we all know what to do when life is good. Our prayers are being answered. We have what we need. Everything's good. But how do you handle it, life when God says no to you? Do you give up? Do we quit? Is our faith gone in the things of God when God says no? There are lessons to be learned when God says no. One thing, it teaches us patience. How many want patience? How many lost it this last week because things didn't go your way? I think we all do, don't we, church? Romans 5, 19 says this in verse 3 and 4. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Verse 4, and patience experience and experience hope. Can somebody say amen? Amen. You know, patience is a thing that we have to achieve and work at. I know this past week, I know since, uh, bless her heart, this morning, uh, Debbie, before I come to church, I just was teasing with her, and she was in there in the kitchen, and uh, I said, honey, would you like to go to church with me today? And I could just see it in her face. She said, honey, I want to be at that church. And I said, you're going to be at that church again. You're going to be at that church. And I said, just just hang in there. Because our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. But last week, uh, I had to take her dinners to her a lot of times to keep her from getting up and out of that chair. And uh, she wanted a, I said, what you want for dinner? She said, I want a banana and peanut butter sandwich. I said, a what? So... I proceed in the kitchen and I make her a peanut butter and banana sandwich. And uh, I took it to her and and a few minutes later I said, well, how was your sandwich, honey? She says, well, it was good, but I didn't like the way you cut the banana up. (laughs) I said, what do you mean cut the banana up? I cut it in strips. She said, you should have cut it in circles. What do you do? You love her. That's what you do. But you know, patience, patience. Learn that church. Learn it. It's a hard lesson to learn. Psalms in 27, 14 says this. Wait upon the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to teach us how to be happy and how to face life when, with strength and boldness, especially when God says no. I could, I could see many of you in this church over the years, the struggles that we've all went through. Daryl, I was thinking of your mom and dad and what y'all had to go through with them before they passed away and the heartache and the struggles they went. All of us in here. But God has sustained us. He's kept us going and kept us on the right path. Amen. I was thinking of James this morning, too. I remember when the pastor and myself and a few more men gathered to pray here at church every morning. And I remember David with all his heart praying, 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 praying for James. Yet he didn't see no change in James. Because it seemed like God had said no. But James kept, or uh, David kept believing that God would change his, his brother. And he's here today because of prayers of men and women praying for him. Because it was the impossible. God says, no, you're going to prison the rest of your life. 
But God had a different plan for him. Amen. We have to allow the Holy Spirit, church, to teach us how to be happy in this life. We have to depend on the Spirit. You have to walk in the Spirit of God every day. We have to face life with strength and boldness. But how many know that God has a right to overrule us in this life? You say, well, I don't like that. But how many know that God has a better plan for us? We think we know it. Lord, if I was to look. That's why God in your life doesn't allow you to see everything that's coming your way. Because if he was to allow you to see everything that's before your life, it would scare you to death. It really would. You wouldn't want to get up out of bed because you knew what was facing you. But God knows all things. He knows the beginning and the end. God knows what's best for you in your life. Can you say amen? amen? He knows the best. He knows what's right for you. And one thing we have to look at, no matter what the situation, when God says no, God is a just God. No matter what you have, you will always have something that humbles you before men and women and the church. How many know it's okay to be humbled at times? Amen. You are either coming out of a situation, a battle, or you're going into another one. We think that life is, once I used to think when I first got in this church that, buddy, once you get saved, all you've got to do is go down to Sears, get you a three-piece suit, and your life is going to be peaches and cream the rest of the way. <laughs> Boy, did I not know what I was thinking. God had to change me. And he will. But God has said no to me a lot of times in this life of things that I've asked for. It's no joke when God says no to you. It's hard to understand why, but how many know he knows the beginning and the ending of your life. He knows what's going on all in between your life. Because see, there's going to be a day one day that there's going to be a number on a grave marker that states your birth. There's going to be a dash and then the date that you departed this earth. What do you want to leave about your, your life? It's like I told little Ricky this morning we, as we was getting ready. Uh, he was wanting to wear a, a cross, so I was getting him one. And I got it, and we got in the car and started leaving out. And I said, Ricky, never be ashamed of the cross. Never be ashamed of the cross. See, Satan wants to make each one of us believe that you're the only one going through troubles. He wants to make you believe that you're the only one that is being picked on. How many know Satan's a deceiver? You know, Satan is nothing to play with. But he has no power over you. He was a created being. All he is is a deceiver. You have all the power to conquer anything that he tries to come against you. And I could tell you that I know from my life when uh, back in 2017 when God, when I went to the doctor just for a checkup and that lady doctor come back out and she didn't look like she was very happy. And she said, Mr. Cruz, I'm sorry to tell you, but you've got cancer in, in four or five places in your body. And I said, well, what stages? She said, four. And I said, God, what's going on? I want to stay here and get that church built, help that church get built for the church. Why have I have to leave now? I got things to do that I want to do for you. But it seemed like God said no. But I tell you what, when you buckle down and you pray, and your church prays, and your family prays, things happen and change in the kingdom of God. It's like the pastor says, the minute you pray, the situation has changed. Things are going on. It's activated the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we could go and move with power. Satan was created, and he's only got a short time that he knows his end is coming soon. Yet he believes he's still somehow going to manage to break free and win. 
But how many know he's not going to win? He's defeated in Jesus' name. You know, and the pastor has, you know, the testimonies that we hear every Sunday, that, that is for a reason. And it's to help and encourage you to keep going and, and not let it get you down. Because, you know, when, when things get down, it's hard to recover. It's hard to go on, just like Cindy, you were talking about your son dying and different things like that. It's hard to overcome that. But you've got to get up. You've got to stand strong in what God says and do it. Praying for each other is one of the main keys that we could do. I've always seen in my life when God says no to me that later on he had the perfect plan designed for me. And he does for you. You might not understand it, but it's there. God's got a plan for you. I've prayed for probably over 30 years for my son to come to God and to get right. I've prayed for now close to 10 or 11 years for Debbie's leg to be healed. I've prayed for my friends and family to get, get saved. My own, a lot of my own grandchildren and people in my family, they're not going to church. The world's got them caught up in this world. In church, there's nothing wrong with doing things with the family. That's what God's whole plan and purpose is. But you need to put God first above everything else. And when you do that, things will happen. The devil wants you to get distracted with things of this earth, with money, with sports, with television, with different things. It's like uh, 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 the young people. It's rough for young people today to be, uh, be, be raised. Because all they see on television is beautiful people. People that have money and everything. And it makes them want that. It's like when all these young girls, bless their heart, they want to look like these girls. And then when they don't, what happens? They get depressed. Depression comes on them. They get defeated because they think they can't live up to what the world expects us to be. The devil is, is smart and he knows how to attack the church. But I'm here to tell you that there one day there's somebody going to be coming in the clouds. <laughs> and he's going to be on a horse. And then one time you're going to be on a horse. You know, I'm scared of horses, but I've got to get used to it, I reckon. Because I've always looked at it like this. I don't want to ride nothing that's bigger and eats more than I do. But the Bible says we're going to be riding on a horse coming back and seeing what's going on in the world. So you better be. That's the reason I like Western so much, I believe. It's all them horses. But God's got a plan. But you know, God, over, over the time when I first started chemo, uh, buddy, the devil would come at me in ways and saying, buddy, you, you're, you're, you've had it. You're gone. Well, Lord, I reckon you'll bring up somebody else to help the pastor and Hubert and Wayne and different ones build the church must not be meant for me to do it but then I got angry I said no you're a liar Satan the word says for me to ask and believe in my heart that what the word says will come to pass it's the same thing when when Jean passed away Every one of us prayed in this church. We fasted. We read the scriptures. We done everything according to the word to do, possibly do. And then she went on to glory, went on to heaven. God said no to us. God said no to the pastor. Why did he say no? God knew that Jean's time was up. Whatever Jean 
God had planned for Jean in this life, she completed it. She fought a good fight. And I'm telling you here right now, heaven ain't never been the same since Jean Shepherd <laughs> Because I'm sure, Jean, right when she got in heaven, she started working on things. And isn't it amazing how all at once God gave this church the money to put that building up? I guarantee you, Jean Shepherdick said, Jesus, come here. <laughs> I got something to talk to you about today. Those people down there at Believer's Joy Worship Center love you. They need some help. Do what you can, Lord. Then Jesus said yes. I'm just amazed. Why are we amazed, church, when God answers our prayers? When he says no, we, we know how to deal with that. But when he says yes, it's like, whoo! How did that happen? Nothing that comes in your life can stop you unless you choose to let it stop you. God is a powerful God. He can do all things. See, God, you have to come to a point in your life, church, when God says no to you, what do you have to do? You still have to love him. Can you say amen? Amen. You don't quit loving him because it doesn't go your way. Because in this life, it's not going to go your way every time. Guarantee you that. You know, as, as I said a while ago, when, you, when you've prayed, when you've fasted, when you've quoted scripture, you've done everything no, be known to God to do in order for a prayer to be answered. And then when it's not answered, what do you do? You trust God. God still you trust him do you trust God in your life in everything do you trust God with your children that's what I've had to do well see there's coming a time church before long this COVID stuff that attacked us how many know how many went to grocery stores at times and seen the shelves being emptied seen things that's just a little old spot of what the world's fixing to hand what the world's fixing to see see I believe the people of God and the family of God when it gets that bad or, or we're here during the tribulation God's going to supernaturally put food on our table we could we could save up and just have a whole house full of food but how many know I couldn't eat if I knew my neighbors needed something to eat. I'd take that one last hot dog and I'd cut it up in seven pieces. <laughs> but I know there's a day coming when we'll stand before God. He'll say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into thy rest. But until then, you've got to do what God tells you to do. And when God says no, keep on, keep on going. Amen? Amen. Trust God. The Bible gives us a great example of a man that had a thorn in his flesh. All his life, he continued to trust God. See, God overruled Paul's life and said no to this man's request for the thorn that, was, that the devil had given him. What was the thorn in Paul's flesh? We really don't know. Some say it was his eyesight. Some say it was some kind of physical disability. Let me read Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. At last I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Who gave him that thorn? Satan. For this thing I besought the Lord twice, that it might be depart from me. 
And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities than the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Can somebody say hallelujah over that? Yes, yes, yes. See, Paul had done many things for the kingdom of God. He had raised the dead. He preached the cross. He was beat all the time. It seemed like Paul, Paul, everywhere he went, he was beat up. Thrown off a cliff, shipwrecked, snake bit. That would have been enough for me right there, being snake bit. <laughs> I'm going to tell you that right now. I would have said right then, Lord, just take me on. Because there's something about a snake. I'm okay once I see them, but it's that first glimpse of that evil thing. But the poor man was snake bit. But what did he do? Shook it off. And those men looked at each other and said, well, he'll be dead before long. He's gone. <laughs> When God's got a plan and a purpose in your life, it's going to stay on the people around you. Yet, no matter what Paul faced, he continued his walk with Christ. Even though God said no to his request of taking that thorn away from him. No matter what each one of us face in this life, God will give you the strength to continue on and not to quit. But that's a choice up to each one of us. You know, as the days approach, church, we're going to see things that we never thought we would see. And as the days approach to the coming of the Lord, the Bible says for us that we're going to need to assemble more and more together. Because we're going to need to be together to get through the last days of this life. God chose each one of you in the last days. He could have put you in any generation before. But he knew he needed you now in the last days. Because he knew that you would be strong in him. A seasoned saint, in other words somebody that's been through life and been through tribulations will continue their walk with Christ. They will not give up. They will keep going. They will love Christ no matter what happens in your life. God has trusted you with the trouble, the heartbreaks in your life. Church, I believe this with all my heart. God will increase your anointing in these last days. He will increase your anointing. You will see things in this church that will blow your mind. This is just a church on the side of the road. But it's a powerhouse for the kingdom of God. Yes. Satan has tried everything in his power to stop this church from way back. When Brother Jim started this church, men tried to stop him from building it. Yet they wind up being dead within a year. Now I go back to thinking time when me and Brother Hubert started tearing down the old building. The first, second day, next thing I know, I see a city truck pulling up. I said, what's he want? Y'all got a permit? Somebody called around here that we were working without a permit. I said, well, we're working on it, which we were. But see how the devil continually tries to stop you from doing what you should do for the kingdom of God? And then all that, 10 years, isn't it, Pastor or more, that we've been trying to get this thing done. Going down to City Hall, back into the, this one, to that one. I would get impatient, Pastor kept the school. <laughs> that one civil engineer we dealt with, I was ready to just go on him. But I knew the pastor was sitting there. I knew my light was not going to shine. 
I was fixing to put it under the table. It's like the old saying when women get mad, don't, don't, don't make me take my earrings off. <laughs> but I had to forgive that man. And I had to just say, and God had a different plan. God worked it out and was able to do it all over because we've got to put a little bridge walkway down here where the culvert, where we got the culvert at. That's over $5,000 just for that. A walkway to nowhere. Because <laughs> there's no other sidewalks when that ends. Not now. But God knows what's ahead of us. He knows what we need. Yes, it is. But we just have to allow the Holy Spirit to deal with our hearts every day of our lives. We have to walk in the Spirit of God and know that His Word is true. Things are going to happen, but we're going to be all right, church. You're going to be okay. The best things for the church is yet to come. I believe, church, and I've, I've said this for years and years, and I know the pastor has too. For whatever reason, this area, God is going to use in a mighty, mighty way in the end times. Why would God choose this area? Because this area has always been the pit of Jacksonville, really. Northside's always been known as, there's nobody out there but trash. But I'm telling you, this place is, is going to be used for the kingdom of God. Yes. I always tell people, I believe Northside people are the best people on earth. Especially Ocean Way people. <laughs> or OW is what I've always called it. The pastor asked me one day, Ricky, what, what's OW? I said, Ocean Way, Pastor. I love this pe this people out here. I love this church. I love each one of you. I don't think I could make it in life if it wasn't for each one of you. But you encourage me. You encourage the pastor and Brother Hubert and Wayne and all of us, the elders. When we say the elders, we mean the elders. <laughs> I mean, it's funny on, on prayer time in the morning when we get in a circle to pray, you hear uh, bones pop. <laughs> you hear, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I'm telling you, church, when you get old, you better be tough. Because it's coming. And you know, I got to laughing, thinking about the other day. You know, to me, now, people that are 30 years old, they're, they're young. And used to, when you was younger, 30 years old, they're old. But now that I'm 71, fixing to be 72, they're young people. But the Bible says Moses didn't start working until he was 80 years old. Amen. <laughs> so what we do is pray for each other in our bodies. Because we just can't do what we used to, but we still keep trying. Amen. Amen. If you'd have seen me and Brother Hubert on the roof the last time we patched that roof up there, it was not a pretty sight. <laughs> it really wasn't. We drug around on the top of that roof with our poor old knees, but we done what we had to do, didn't we, Brother Hubert? We got it done. Yes, sir. See, and we've been praying for a roof for this church because we knew this part needed to be fixed. And what has God done? He's given us a new roof. He's going to give us a building. I'll be so glad when we get in that new church. Number one, the reason being... We won't have to move them tables every time we eat. <laughs> Number two, this pulpit up here, I keep thinking I'm going to fall off this sucker. We're going to have room to run in the new building. But we're going to have room to have new people in there. To have people disciple, disciple. Church, you just don't know how important it is. When hurting people come into a church... For them to be loved by you. 
We sit back and I see you every time somebody new that comes in this church. I see you take the time to go and, and hug their neck. Show them the love of Christ. It makes an impact on them. I've heard of churches where you go in and I've been in churches where nobody will say one word to you. I'm talking about the preacher too. Well, I tell you what, when you come here, you're going to get loved. You're going to get took care of and we're going to take care of each other. Because that's what God's plan was. We're going to go from house to house, city to city, and nation to nation. Do you believe that, church? I just want to encourage you to keep going. Don't buckle to the things of this world. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. I love you, church. We're going to make it. We're going to make it. We're going to make it. And I thank God for Gene talking to Jesus to get him to get this money flowing. Because I guarantee you she did it. She did it. She did. I know Gene Shefferdeck did it. I know uh, yesterday I, before I paired this message I seen the video of the pastor and his granddaughter doing that dance. And I seen, oh, you know, you hear Gene laugh on that, that video. And I said, Lord, I'd just love to hear it one more time. But see, God said no right now. But there's a yes coming. <laughs> there's a yes coming, preacher. There'll be a day when you enter in through the gates that Jean Shepherd that will be right there. And she's going to get you straight for all the things you've done since she's been gone. <laughs> she's not going to let you slide. You know that, right? I can always recall the first time that me and the pastor, uh, we had a work day at church, and uh, we was working. Anyway, Jean got off in her car, wouldn't crank. So she called Lyle, and the preacher said, Ricky, come on, let's go get her crank. Crank dice. Okay. Now, that's after I just started coming to this church. And, uh, you know, when you first come to a church and you see godly people, and when you're an old sinner and been in sin for years and years, you just think you can never be as good as other people. You know, that's the way the deceiver tries to tell you that. You'll never be good as these people. But anyway, we went and there Jean was. When we pulled up, she had that look on her that I've seen in my wife. <laughs> where, where a person gets hot. <laughs> So my preacher gets out of his truck and he goes over there and she rakes him up one side and down the other. And I got tickled because I said to myself, you know, they're no different than me. <laughs> they lose their temper too. <laughs> we got her crank, pastor got back in the car and I said, preacher, you need to come home with me tonight. <laughs> But that's life, isn't it, church? We love each other through the good times and the bad times. But walk in the Spirit and see what God will do in your life. Amen. Amen. Pastor? You know, I, I knew this morning that the Holy Spirit was going to be moving in this place. Yes. Amen. I knew that He would be moving. <clears throat> And the word he gave me, it, it impacted me. I mean, it came out of my mouth, but it's impacted me. There's no death in the presence of God. Amen. There's no sickness in the presence of God. There's no fear in the presence of God. Yes. Get into God's presence. I did the day. I try and do it every single day. And it invigorates you, it energizes you, it empowers you, it heals you. And it starts not, it starts from the spirit inside of you and then works outward into your flesh. And tragically, sadly, most Christians, I say, don't go there. When the doors are wide open for you to come into God's presence, 
to enter into His presence. We come into His presence with thanksgiving. We enter his, into His gates with thanksgiving. We go into His presence in joy and worship in Him yes. because there is joy, joy, yes. joy yes. in God's presence. Better than anything you've ever experienced in this life. Truly, truly, truly. And God gave me that revelation on June 20th, 7th, when I saw that window open again. And there she was right beside me, and she was full of joy. And she said those words, isn't this wonderful? Because she was in pure joy, and along with other millions and billions of other people, there was in pure joy. And there's no death in heaven. That's right. None whatsoever. There's no death, there's no sickness, there's no nothing. And we, as children of God, we can go right into that presence up there. We may or may not see anything, but God's presence will come down and come through you and bubble up inside of you like a river of living water by the Holy Spirit inside you. Ladies and gentlemen, learn to turn the valve open. Amen. To open it up. Enjoy God. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing to let Him fill you and flow through you and fill you with that joy. Yes. And it gets to the point, I don't want to leave it. Yes. It's, it's too much almost. It's overwhelming. It's wonderful. It is wonderful. And you get into that presence and you feel that power m moving through you, then you, you want to take that power and go put it on somebody. Give it to somebody. Here, enjoy this. Enjoy this. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. It really is. How do you do that? Get alone with God. Go into the bedroom with God. Yes. It's called, well, some call it the hiding place. One calls it the prayer closet. I remember Jane Crane, when she first found out about it, she actually cleared out her closet. Like that, what was that movie? War Room or something? Other? She really did that. Jane, if any of you older ones